Thank you. Uh, I apologize for yet another presentation in English, but I hope the images will be interesting. Um, what we're seeing today, much of this is evidence of why this is a, tremendous, a tremendously exciting time to be alive, and um, I hope that we'll find even more reasons today. So um, it's 1982, and we're in a period of media transition. Film is giving ground to video, and the world is filled with film that nobody wants. Producers and distributors are very quietly going out of business. I had been a, a researcher for documentary films and realized how much had never been collected by archives. Uh, I began to collect what I called ephemeral films, industrial, advertising, educational, government films, as well as home movies and personal media. Established archives were remarkably passive. Uh, in this area. And in fact, the United States is such a media-rich country that no one ever seemed to care if film was being lost. So I organized an unofficial uh, private archives and funded it by charging for access to our collection of stock footage. This was much, much easier to do in the United States than it would have been in Europe because we have a rich public domain and because we have no serious moral rights laws. Business was good, and many producers were very, very interested in using this material that depicted our life, culture, landscape, and industry in such a fascinating way. And then in 1999, I moved from New York City to San Francisco and soon came into contact with Brewster Kale, the philanthropist and founder of Internet Archive. In our first phone call, after we'd been on the phone for about 20 seconds, he challenged me to put my archives online for free. Why don't you put your archives online for free, he said. I was a New Yorker and I'd never heard of the open source movement. I thought information wanted to be expensive, so I argued with him, but it seemed unfair to me that so many important historical resources could only be accessed by a few people, and we agreed to move ahead. I was very conscious that this was an experiment. You know, it was funny because my income and my well-being and the roof over my head completely came from selling access to our collection. So I had my doubts, but I'm a contrarian, and I had to move ahead. So I proposed to Brewster, let's begin with 1,001 films, because 1,000 wouldn't be as interesting. And I, I can't describe my curatorial decisions in a short time, but we could come back to this. Internet Archive critically subsidized film to videotape transfer, hosting and bandwidth, and this was my first lesson in one of the quieter truths behind many, many open access projects, that if you peel the layers back, quite often you'll find some kind of subsidy. Um, and here's the online archive. Oh, you can't really see that, can you? At three months, 750 films. Looks beautiful. Website, doesn't it? After 14 years, the collection is now 6,400 items. More are coming. And if you put, if you crunch the numbers and you look at how many of our films have been downloaded and you add this to material that you can tell has been mirrored elsewhere, it looks like about 100, 100 million films have been served up. This is interesting because our collection is terribly obscure and specialized, so 100 million of these films is a lot. Um, I should say that right now Internet Archive, as of last night, has 1.8 million moving image items and clips from 639,000 TV news broadcasts. So, when I'm in Europe, the first, second, and third questions that I always get are always about copyright. So I'm gonna to try to anticipate these so that we can move beyond copyright and talk about more interesting things. US and European copyright law are different in a few important areas. First, many more works have fallen into the public domain. Oh, we're supposed to say risen into the public domain in the United States. Um, I think there's between four and 500,000 movies that are out of copyright in the US. And second, moral rights, droit moral plays a much smaller role in American law so that we can edit clips, we can reformat films. And then third, if one of our contributors makes a mistake and uploads copyrighted material, we have the DMCA. But most of what I collected is out of copyright, so I didn't have concerns. 
We've, however, we've put a bunch of orphan works online. And for those of you who don't know, orphan works are works under copyright whose author is unknown or cannot be located to grant permission. Home movies. This is a box I opened up at home, and look at what I found. More hippies. Um, home movies are the quintessential orphan works because just about every home movie is an unpublished work and who owns rights is often a mystery. So I have permission to reuse a few, but we have about 13,000 home movies, and I cannot morally accept the idea of blocking off this entire important area of culture from public access. You know, personal media will be far more significant in the future than institutional media. I have a hunch that almost all access requests for archives in the future will relate to personal media rather than institutional. This is very interesting because of data protection laws. So um, a complicated issue, but aside from sensitive material, I've started to put our home movie collections online. Um, what kind of access model did we adopt? So everyone who shares resources very quickly has to come up with their own definition of openness. And it needs to be a definition that you can act on. It cannot be theoretical. And this was my first experience with opening up content, so I gravitated towards a restrictive model, which you can't really see above. It was inexcusable, I apologize. But I had a, a representational agreement with Getty Images that I needed to honor. Um, but in a few months, we just dropped all these restrictions. This is our, our current statement of rights, which could not be more permissive or more welcoming. You are warmly encouraged to download, use, and reproduce. And in late 2002, we adopted the Creative Commons license. You know, this is not in the official history. If you read David Ballier's book, you will not find this. But we were the first significant cultural collection to, to use the CC license. In fact, CC sort of begged us to, to use a special public domain declaration that said we don't have rights to most of this material, but we declare it as public domain because they desperately needed content to launch. This was our model. I don't think I need to go into this. This is what today some people call freemium. The idea is that we sell at a value but the content is infrastructure, right? The material itself is part of this common heritage that we all share. I hate to use this, um, this uh, analogy, but you know, the water is free, the bottles cost money. Um, how is this going to affect our existing stock footage business? We didn't know. This was a rather interesting question. We think we made more money because this happened at a time when license fees were decreasing and the market for historical material was terrible. And it also helped us maintain the Prelinger brand name within the vast Getty Images empire. My best estimate, and I'm not putting it on a slide, but it was that our revenue increased by 62% over two years. Um, this was our first web page leading to the digitized film files. My terrible looking interface that I used FileMaker to generate. Um, Two days after we, up, we, we built the site at the end of December 2000, we looked, at the, um, uh, we looked at the directories and we found out that we left the right permissions unlocked and people had uploaded some episodes of South Park. Um, this was altruistic, but we changed the permissions because we didn't want to get shut down. But this donation is really interesting. What it meant was that even in the first three days we were up, that some of our users had already seen our collection as a place of hospitality. You know, if any of you follow archival theory, Vern Harris of South Africa talks about Jacques Derrida and the conception of the hospitable archive. Um, and also, you know, that early on, long before YouTube, that people got the idea that online archives should be participatory. Um, the site was a, a tremendous success. It sort of broke our, our bandwidth. But archivists didn't like it very much. Um, they were suspicious about a number of things. Number one, that we were building a large collection for access only that we were digitizing without first preserving the film to film, and that we were, we were presenting video in non-archival formats, too low res. 
that we were building an archive site without metadata that conformed to metadata standards, that we were propagating material in high-res formats, that we were giving too much away. So we were being criticized for being low-res as well as for being high-res. There were some people that were very angry. There still are people that were very angry today that were not streaming that we're allowing people to download. And I'm just going to tell you my opinion, you know, and I have nothing against sissies, but streaming is for sissies. You need to be able to give people access to material in a downloadable uh, environment. I'll talk about that more. Many archivists were concerned about the idea of letting material go without restrictions. They said, we are going to lose control but you know, the fact is, is that if you're not allowed to release your holdings, you've already lost control. Uh, what could be worse? But in any case, we continued, so it's been 14 years. So I wanted to mention some significant issues. How persistent is this collection? Will it endure? Will it survive? We're exposing and storing copies for access. These are video, these are scanned copies of film originals. They're not the original materials themselves. So the films, in a sense, back up the scans. But you know the scans also back up the films, because we could lose film. Um, and this kind of begs the question, is it better to conserve records under private ownership, or should we also rely on the crowd? Because you know the crowd saves the scans. Many people download everything using the fabulous wget command, which Ed Snowden used, of course. Um, I don't take persistence for granted, and to me it is axiomatic that we'll have to digitize film more than once in its lifetime. Um, I'm already doing that. Metadata is a huge problem for us. Um, I didn't wait for all the metadata to be perfect before I put records up. I couldn't. And I also didn't build a mechanism to maintain it. I hoped the community would step in, and for the most part, they have not. The annotations, the commentary, the reviews, very uneven quality. There's hate speech, and there's a lot of inaccurate information regarding films. You know, a lot of people, including many of the IMDB contributors, believe that if they wish a fact to be true, then it is true. You know, that's true about copyright law in the United States. Copyright law is what people wish it was, and they'll, be, they'll tell you that that's what it is. It's very interesting. There's, fan culture is wonderful, and I don't disrespect it, but it isn't infallible. So I don't know who's going to take the time to make this metadata better. Most of us can't um, generate uh, metadata that's up to scholarly or even fan standards. We have only one portal. There's only one way to access films in the Internet Archive. Yes, anybody can skin it. Anybody can link into it, but people haven't done that. The portal has a bias towards fan appreciation. Here's some reviews of Design for Dreaming. Thousands of educators, researchers, and scholars use the site, but they're not present. You wouldn't know that they're there. They don't show up. We need an education portal, maybe a scholarly portal. The physical preparation of material for digitizing is a challenge. For me, it's the number one roadblock to sharing materials online. It's expensive. It requires people who know what they're doing. I tried to crack this nut by convening a group of um, emerging and would-be archivists who would uh, receive um, training, professional training, in exchange for volunteering, and it sort of worked, but it didn't happen at scale. When you put digital collections online for public access, you're in the retail business, and you need to offer some kind of support. And it's been 15 years, and people still write me emails saying, how do I download? There's still a lot of people who don't realize that, number one, downloading might meet their needs better than streaming, and number two, or playing through a browser, and number two, who don't know how to right-click or control-click. Um, how do we want to think about copyright as laws evolve? I happen to think that extended collective licensing, which seems to work very nicely in Norway, um, is a problem. And the regularization of orphan works is also a problem. If any of you have seen Melissa Terrace's blog, she's a blog, she's doing a series of posts about negotiating the new orphan works clearance portal in the UK. 
Um, who are these collective licensing organizations going to be? You can't necessarily trust that every nation will set up a clean one. How much will they cost to administer? Who will get the money? And why should individuals have to go through the same process that a major publisher or studio or distributor might have to go through? I couldn't have built our site under ECL or under a regularized Orphan Works uh, regime. And you know, the other thing about ECL is that it implies that if you're going to, to, to do mass digitization, that it must be backed up by funding um, to cover these expenses. And in the environment that I come from, this is very unlikely because we're not, we don't have the same cultural consciousness in the United States that we have in Europe. We're, we are dominant worldwide, so as a result, we haven't developed a way to, to fund the propagation of U.S. culture online because we already own the Internet, which is not so good. But as cultural custodians, um, we're obliged to take the long view. This means we cannot postpone thinking about issues that last longer than copyright. How do we temper openness with request? How do we respect indigenous or community cultural and intellectual property rights? Um, was this project successful? Well, no objective metrics, but some outcomes and some criteria. Some attributes of the accessible archives, I have put this online so you can look at that. Our online experience led us in all these directions. A couple of these are kind of important. Um, I'll just say the last one. We have avoided being crippled by the precautionary principle. I can say a few things. So we made original historical films available to a very broad public who used them in, in non-traditional and traditional unorthodox ways. This had never before happened. Uh, cultural heritage under institutional control has been trickling out piecemeal except in Norway and a few other countries. It's a wonderful, wonderful story you tell. But we've been able to achieve a measure of mass distribution of an interesting corpus. We played a role in lowering the price of public domain material, use fees. This could be a double-edged sword. We influenced countless scholars who otherwise might never have considered using moving images in their, um, in their research. The films have propagated into hundreds of papers, dissertations, books. We we strongly influenced the development of a fan culture based on industrial and educational film. If any of you have seen Mystery Science Theater 3000, we played a key role in helping move ordinary film, useful film, quotidian film from the cultural periphery towards the center. In a less tangible way, we increased the sense of entitlement with which people regard the internet and moving image archives generally. To, to borrow from Lawrence Lessig, we replaced a model of scarcity with a model of plenty. We gave people a sense of how a gift economy might work, and we helped to expand makers' sense of how archival materials could be used beyond the heavily overdetermined way that they're used in documentary. We made U.S. cultural and social history available for commentary and remixing by younger people, by newer Americans. And I think ultimately we helped push forward, and this isn't just us, this is also the Internet Archive and other people who've done this. We helped push forward a new sense of how central archives are to the world. To engage in archival activity is to intervene in the flow of history. And I think many more people understand that. We helped to make archivists and archival practice cool. We had a band named after us. This is the Prelinger Archives Orchestra from Brazil. Um, the future. We felt a little lonely when the project started. We still do. Most moving collections, image collections, are not online. There's a kind of exceptionalism that seems to apply to films. Or if they're online, they're not available for most kinds of use. Viewing only access is not open access. We need to think of moving images and audio as we think of code, as objects that users are able to freely access, to download, modify, and manipulate. And you know why one reason that's emerging is that increasingly our audience will be machines, not just people, and they need to touch those files.
Now, I know we're not going to be able to offer free access to all cultural resources, but as we enumerate the reasons for cultural enclosure and as we make our excuses as to why we can't make certain materials available, let's take the responsibility to specify why we cannot release something, how and, well we, how and when we will release it, and who will do that. If we cannot offer openness right now, let's at least make a plan for it. And this plan should specify what records we're going to, st we're going to declare what records will lie outside the realm of property. I have three more slides. Um, project like, projects like ours have helped to mainstream archival activity because today digital culture has rendered archival activity universal. Kenny Goldsmith says, the ways in which culture is distributed and archived has become profoundly more in intriguing than the cultural artifact itself, an inversion of consumption. Finally, we may not survive projects such as YouTube. Now, I'm a tremendous fan of YouTube. It's hugely paradoxical. It's an amazing repository that offers a hit for almost every query, that permits anyone to upload their work and let it intermingle with the work of their cultural heroes. It's a magnet for personal media. It fills the persistent gap between the world of personal media and the archival ecosystem that has avoided collecting it. No established archives will ever serve as many videos to as many people. It enables countless instances of media and multimedia authorship and remix uh, that legacy archives never wanted to enable and couldn't have enabled on their own. But its relationship with users, we could describe it as a non-committal handshake. Archival persistence, digital longevity, and resistance from outside interference get traded in for the appearance of openness, for the absence of latency, quick response, and an omnivorous collecting policy which, if it's curated at all, um, is done by machines that know that they can't expose certain videos to Chinese IP addresses. So just as we're willingly trading in our resilient copper wire telephone networks for the stimulation of our app-driven but incredibly unreliable smartphones, we've exchanged the traditional archives for the apparent archives. We gain an appearance of completeness that is in fact filled with gaps, and I doubt any established institution will ever be able to catch up with them or the larger um, commercial collections that follow. I, I will end by saying um, we do things differently in the US and Europe. We're very good at entrepreneurial bottom-up initiatives, ready, fire, aim. You do national level comprehensive digitization projects that involve concurrence by many, many stakeholders. We're more disposed to question copyright maximalism. Here in Europe, copyright often seems to be beyond question. I don't know which is better, but we really have to bridge this gap somehow. We've got to hybridize. Um, thank you. <laughs>